Hi, and welcome to the show. Rate and review at kevinemedy.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinemedy.com slash podcast. Today in the show, we have Heidi Chumley. She is Dean at Ross University School of Medicine, and her Kevin MD article, which we'll talk about today, is titled, Who Gets to Go to Medical School? Heidi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Heidi Chumley. I'm a family physician by training. I went to medical school, did my residency, also did a academic leadership fellowship out at University of Texas, San Antonio Health Science Center. Uh, Many years ago, that was where my first faculty position was. I went from there to University of Kansas School of Medicine, spent, spent eight years out there, four on the senior leadership team, and then about 10 years ago was recruited to be dean at American University of the Caribbean, a, another international school. And I'll tell you, I wasn't planning when I was interviewing for that job to actually ever, ever take it. That can be our little secret, Kevin, right? Wasn't actually planning to take it until I got out there and met the students. And my experience from Kansas had been, you know, every year we had a hundred students from Kansas who were qualified to go to medical school, who we couldn't fit in our class, Mm. wondered where they were. But when I went down there and was interviewing for this job and had a chance to sit and talk with those, with a group of students, I just had this epiphany, right? This is like, here's where they are. Here's where these students are. And I wanted to to change the, you you know, what I was doing with my career and then move into this area. So, so fast forward, it's been about eight and a half years there. And then about a year ago was moved over to Ross University School of Medicine, same parent company, their sister schools and have been there for the last year. So whenever we talk about medical schools, international medical schools in the Caribbean, there's a certain perception about them. So what are some misconceptions that you just want to clear up to my clinician audience? Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that. I've been working on that for 10 years, right? So I think that probably one of the the strongest misperceptions is that the students who go to international medical schools, particularly in the Caribbean, are not qualified. There is a misperception that the students there somehow are, you know, not as good as their U.S. counterparts. I think there is also a a perception that, you know, that the schools will take anybody and, and, from that, I think then stems the other things that you hear just about the overall quality of the educational program in those different places. All right. And we're going to talk more about that, but let's lead into that with your Kevin MD article titled, Who Gets to Go to Medical School? And for those of you who get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it and share the story why you decided to write it. Who Gets to Go to Medical School is really about educational justice. And it's about what are the things that we do as a a set of leaders in U.S. medical education that let some students, some people have an opportunity to become doctors and keep others from having that opportunity. And if we think about, you know, the only way to be a physician, right? The only way to be a physician is get to go to medical school. So, so the opportunity to do that really separate who has that opportunity. In the article, I go into a few things that have been just really longstanding traditions of medical school admissions. Talk about the MCAT and the MCAT's role in the selection process and how there may be, you know, some challenges around that. And then also talk about a few of the other things that are held in pretty you know, high regard by admissions committees, ability to shadow volunteer experiences that aren't paid work and how those things also are probably, you know, not equally distributed opportunities across our society. So tell me in general, some demographic characteristics of those who choose to go to medical school in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. So the students that we have out in the Caribbean at first, back to your misperceptions question, about 85% do come from the U.S. So that's something that I think a lot of people don't know. We do have higher percentages of underrepresented minority students that uh, join us out in the Caribbean than you'll see in the United States. And tell us about the training, the didactics, the facilities in general. Yeah, really very similar to a U.S. style education. So our students spend 
their first year and eight months. We're on three, we are in three semester year. So year and eight months out doing medical sciences, which is learning, you know, the same disciplines that they teach in the U.S., same organ system focus, teaching early clinical skills. Students then take the USMLE step one exam, same exam they take in the or same exam the allopathic students in the U.S. take. And then after they spend their time out there in the Caribbean, come back to the U.S. and do their clinical rotations in many different hospital partners in the U.S. Take step two, go through the same residency match, and, and end up in the same residencies as many of their peers that went to U.S. medical schools. So one of the comments that I often read is that sometimes there's a little bit of a contrast between residency matching from medical schools in the Caribbean in contrast to those to the United States. So can you comment on that? Uh, it is a little bit more difficult, right, for students who go to international medical schools to, to match in the residency program. Not that their success rate is any different. We have a really high success rate, but they do have to jump through a couple of extra hoops. So all the students who attend an international medical school have to go through the ECFMG to go into a U.S. residency program. And there are a couple of extra hurdles to be certified by the ECFMG for the match. The first is an occupational English test that they have to take before they can be certified. The second part that is, is more of a nuanced difference is that the students coming from international medical schools have to have passing scores on their USMLE Step 1 and USMLE Step 2 exams before they can actually be in the match. Your U.S. students can be going to take the test, not have their scores back yet, and still enter the match. But, mm. but the international students, they actually have to have those scores already posted. So it alters their timeline. That makes it a little bit more difficult to hit an aggressive timeline. What's the proportion who go into, say, primary care specialties versus subspecialties? Yeah, we do see more of our students match into primary care residency, certainly a much needed field in the U.S. We have, in addition to more going into primary care, I think, you know, the question is always going into a primary care residency program doesn't mean you'll actually stay in primary care. And we do have a higher percentage both that go into primary care residencies and actually are practicing in primary care five years out. So if I'm a pre-medical student and I'm looking at the various options that are out there, what kind of questions should I be asking myself if I do want to consider an international medical school? Yeah, great. Really important question because there are a lot of international medical schools and they vary dramatically in, in quality. So the first most important question to ask is, is the school accredited and by who? <laughs> and then the second most important question I think to ask is, how is that school's students doing with the really important outcomes? What's the chances of getting into a U.S. residency program? How are their students doing on the licensing exams? Another thing that is a helpful measure of quality is where can the students do rotations in the U.S.? Many states in the U.S. have some pretty, pretty high bars that schools need to get over in order to have their students come to those states. New York is certainly one of them. And any of those, any of those that students see can be markers of quality. And then after that, perhaps what today's students would do even before that, talk to your friends, talk to your peers, find somebody enrolled in the school that you're, you're thinking about and get, and really get the inside story of how, what it's going to be like to go to school there. Now, what kind of pre-medical students should consider medical school internationally? So if you are a student who perhaps is not the best um, test taker, if you've been put on wait list, if you're not getting interviews, but if medicine is your passion, just take a look at an international medical school. Our school, others are set up to help students who have had different levels of preparation or opportunity coming into medical school. And we find a lot of people actually really thrive in that type of situation. And in terms of the clinical experiences, so talk about some of the clinical experiences at Ross. Yeah. Well, let me talk about those in two buckets because we've got what we call our early clinical experiences. So those are the experiences you're going to have when you're out on the island of Barbados. And that's actually a pretty exciting thing if you think about it. You get to be in a different society, in a different type of healthcare setting, engaged as a, you know, in meaningful early 
appropriate encounters, really getting to, to understand how medicine can work in a number of different places, particularly a lower resource area. Great, great introduction to medicine. Clinical experiences in the clinical years are in hospitals in the U.S., generally alongside students from allopathic or osteopathic schools, and just quite similar to the experiences that a student's going to have at a U.S. medical school. Do the majority of students, do they do rotations in the United States, or what's the breakup in terms of those who stay at Ross versus going to the United States? Oh, so all students come to the U.S. to do their clinical rotations, okay. 100%. Yeah, the experiences I was talking about earlier, what they do in their you know, basic science years to help contextualize what they're learning in the mm -hmm. sciences and keep them motivated. And in terms of the cost, how does that contrast with medical schools, allopathic medical schools in the United States? Yeah. So you know what, if you can, if you're going to your own state school, it's going to be a lot less expensive to go to your state school. If you're looking at going out of state or to an osteopathic school, the international schools are going to sit kind of right in the middle of, of those cost-wise. We're talking to Heidi Chung. She is Dean at Ross University School of Medicine. And we're going to talk about her Kevin MD article, Who Gets to Go to Medical School? So Heidi, tell me about some of the challenges students may face or some of the challenges that you face as a dean at Ross University. As we come through and we're on the other side of the pandemic, a lot of the work that we had really done that was highly successful at really closing that gap from where students were to where they needed to be successful in medical school, a lot of that gap widened during the pandemic. We noticed that. I think schools everywhere noticed that. And, and now we know that we're really probably sitting on at least a couple more years of students who will come to us that have had a really disrupted college education or even a really disrupted couple of years of life before coming back to medical school and really working through, you know, what are the things we need to do differently than what we've done in the past that's been successful to continue to be, to really be great partners for these students and help them be successful. And when you look at the entire spectrum of medical education, talk about the role that international medical schools like Ross, what role do you play in the spectrum of medical education? Yeah, well, a hugely important role. I think, you know, there is a physician shortage in the U.S. It's been there. It's ongoing. We, you know, we think it's going to continue to be a challenge. It's certainly not enough capacity in the U.S., even with the growth of U.S. medical schools to meet that need. So one of the primary, you know, roles of international medical schools is to really support the U.S. physician workforce. And we do that with numbers, but also through the diversity of the students that we train. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience? Yeah. Well, if I understand your audience, I know that they're largely clinicians and, and, I think, you know, certainly that everyone who is a clinician these days has the opportunities to talk to young people who are interested in the health professions, be that in medicine, be that, you know, PA, nurse practitioner, whatever. There are people that are interested and there are many people who are interested, who are continuing to get messages from our society that perhaps you're not qualified or perhaps you're not, don't have the academic credentials that you would need to be a a physician. So I would love for all of your audience, if I could have every single one of them, Kevin, to really help with the message of, you know, let's just broaden our thinking a little bit about that. And, and perhaps the academic credentials that were necessary or were thought to be necessary for so many years, perhaps it's really a bit broader than that. And that there are opportunities for, for people, particularly at the international medical schools that are good opportunities that can help students who've had a different set of opportunities or the different level of readiness can really help them be successful as physicians. Heidi, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you for having me.